is the best rendition of Abraham Lincoln that you will ever see. He was exactly this tall. His face is actually made from a life vest made of him in 1865, right before he died. His hands are made from hand molds made of him in 1861. His hat was made an exact copy of his hat, jacket the same thing. His shoes are actually was made from diagrams made by his cobbler. This is the best you're gonna get. And uh, you notice that he is referring with his hat up to that window up there. That is the Will's house. That's where he stayed when he came to deliver the Gettysburg Address. And that's the room he stayed in. He actually finished the Gettysburg Address up in that room. Now this guy right here, he's considered the every tourist. But it's all actually Perry Como. You guys ever hear of Perry Como? Big singer in the early 60s. My, grand, my mom loved him. And you look at him, it looks like Perry Como. Well, anyway, there's been rumors in town for years that this was actually Perry Como, but we weren't sure. Well, I actually talked to a lady that actually knew the sculptor. That guy's name is Seward Johnson. Now, Seward Johnson is a member of the Johnson & Johnson pharmaceutical family, and he was the one kid in the family that didn't want to do drugs. He wanted to actually do sculptures, and he had a lot of money to do it, so we could. And uh, according to her, the, uh, every time he did a sculpture, he always had to put in some little inside joke that not that many people would get. Well, this guy's kid, Perry Como. But it's not too far off because Perry Como was actually from Pennsylvania. But apparently, Lincoln went to Mama. Uh, the show guys, largest venue in South Central Pennsylvania at the time. They used to show all the silent movies in there, have all the vaudeville acts. Uh, Eisenhower and White Mamie used to come in and watch their movies. They also uh, have had uh, actually movie premieres here. And the movie Gettysburg was premiered right here. You can imagine the red carpets all lined up here, all the stars all came by to see it. Well, they're actually, you guys want to see what that kind of looks like, you can come here in October because they're actually going to have a re-premiere of the movie. They're going to bring back all the stars, Stephen Lang, Sam Elliott, uh, all the other guys, Ron Maxwell, the director and all that, and they're going to basically do it all over again. It's going to be really cool. Now, another movie premiere is going to be happening here in November. It was a movie called uh, Christmas in Gettysburg. It was shot last year. I have no idea what it's about, but it stars Lee Majors. Remember Lee Majors, the $6 million man? Yeah, that was a lot older. He's worth about six fifty. But basically, um, I don't know what it's about. He's supposed to be playing like some spirit of, I have no idea what it's going to be. It sounds like a Hallmark type thing, but they're all going to be here. And we actually had to have all of our Christmas decorations set up right here until March because they were doing all the filming up there, so it was pretty neat. So basically, but also be aware, if you ever go in there and watch a movie, you have to understand that this is, this is attached to a haunted hotel. So basically, you can be in there eating the popcorn, and that empty seat next to you, you better keep an eye out for your, for your stuff around here, all waiting for him to show up. The steam engine's right there with the smoke all coming up. And Abraham Lincoln, he's tall, he's easy to spot, right? They're waiting for him to come off the train. He steps off that train, the place goes pile. A brass band right there starts up, starts playing, all these veterans are playing it. And he came out welcoming everybody, right where we're standing right now. But then they actually walk from this place, up that sidewalk, up to the Will's house. Now it looks like they're actually having a, uh, looks like they're having a presentation of a guy that plays Lincoln, and he's going to be here tonight, so it might be something you want to check out. Actually, the guy showed up on my tour last night, and I'm talking about Lincoln, and all of a sudden I look over, and the guy's standing right there. It was pretty kind of surreal. Anyway, now this place was really cool when Lincoln came, but it wasn't that cool after the battle. This place was desolate. There was all kinds of damage in here, bodies all over the place, and when you're going to have all those bodies, you got to realize you're going to start having problems with people actually having to get rid of them. And they had a shortage of wood. So what they ended up doing is they took his, the coffins, they made them as small as they could, stuffed the bodies inside, hammered the top on it, and laid them out next to the tracks. Well, remember, it is July. It is hot. They said it was one of the hottest Julys on record. And you know what happens to bodies when they're laying out in the sun, right? Uh, yeah. A lot of the first time they started moving all over the place. It smelled really bad here in Gettysburg. They said that it smelled so bad here in Gettysburg that they could smell this town as far away as York. That's 30 miles away from here. Imagine how bad it was for the people here. They also said the fences were so covered with flies you couldn't even see the wood. It was one big moving mass of bugs. They went down, they were afraid. They thought there was going to be some sort of a plague that was going to come through and kill everybody. So for them to be able to actually go outside without passing out, they actually had to take a handkerchief, douse it with like lavender oil and stuff, and put it over their face. Now, if you look down there, uh, all around down that street right there, right behind those buildings, that is Gettysburg College. And the Confederates actually used that as a uh, Confederate field hospital during the battle. Now, right next to the tracks up there, there was an old uh, pauper cemetery. That's where they actually buried all the people in town that were poor, and they couldn't have any other place to bury them. They didn't even have gravestones and stuff. Well, after the battle was over, like there were some kids around playing, and as they were out there playing, they bent down and they found a revolver left over from the battle. Well, they do what little kids do, right? They picked it up and started going, yeah, bang, 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 bang. Well, anyway, across that other side of that pauper cemetery, there was a girl watching them, and the kids did what kids did back then, too. They went, oh, yeah? Bang! Shot her right in the chest. Killed her instantly. Now, she was from a poor family, so they actually buried her in that pauper cemetery. Now, there's some houses down there, and they were actually making some construction. And uh, later on, but one of the buildings there is kind of weird. It does not have a basement. It's just built right on the top of the ground. Well, the college was doing some renovations, turning that those places into student housing. And when they were doing the construction, they realized why. They built over the top of that pauper cemetery. 
they found a couple of graves there. And when they actually did, they found one of those coffins had the bones of a young girl with a hole in her sternum. And they think that may have been that girl. Also, laying on her chest was a little slate tablet that had the word Dinah scratched into it. They think that was her name. Now, there was a lady over there who was doing some postgraduate work in photography, and she took three quick pictures of the college. The first picture had a car going through it. Can't use that one. The third one was a beautiful picture of the college. The second picture, though, had the image of a young girl with a white dress on and a big red box on her chest. Hotel. And the Gettysburg Hotel was actually here during the battle. Except for the top two floors. Now, during the battle, some kids actually got up on the roof and they watched the battle from up there. Where the heck were their families, right? <laughs> well, anyway, after the battle was over, this place was turned into a field hospital. You can imagine this thing is chock full of wounded soldiers, all of the doctors, the nurses. When you have all that happening, they're going to start to get, like, shortages of, like, medical supplies and stuff. And apparently, they're still up there looking for them. There's a nurse up there whose name is Rachel. And she uh, actually is associated with room 311, more, more, more so on the third floor. But she also swears like a pirate. People will be up there. I just had a customer last night had something happen up there. She's actually, they were actually in room 311. And she said that they heard somebody in the hallway going back and forth going, Where are those tiny bandages? Sorry. Maybe you know what So anyway, basically, uh, people in the room 311, though, will also report their drawers will sometimes be open. Now, nothing is ever stolen. Okay, let me tell you that right there. But if they just think that actually Rachel was in there looking for those medical supplies. Now, I had a kid on my tour one time that actually said, Well, what if you have medical supplies? And I said, well, gee, I don't know. I think that's actually a pretty good question. I have no idea. Now, this is also important because of a guy that actually used to have meetings here. The guy's name was the white David Eisenhower, president of the United States. His house is right on the other side of the battlefield. Now, you guys know of, like, uh, Mar-a-Lago, right? You know of Walker's Point. Well, this was his place. And people used to come here all the time to visit him. And he loved that. He would give them tours all around the town and the battlefield. Very proud of this place. And uh, even people would actually come to visit him in his house. There was a report of one dignitary that was driving down Emmitsburg Pike, and as they were driving toward his house, they looked over to the left, and they actually saw a unit of Union soldiers marching in perfect formation right next to the road. And the guy's thinking, wow, that's really cool. He gets to the Eisenhower house to thank them for what they did, and they had no idea what he was talking about. And this was in the mid-50s. They weren't even doing reenactments back then. So anyway, you guys may be out on the battlefield. You'll see somebody dressed up like me, and you think, okay, that's just a reenactor. The next person behind you, they don't see anything. So you may have actually seen a ghost, but you didn't even think you did. Now, in the 1980s, early 1980s, this actually had a big fire. It gutted out the whole place. They were going to tear it down. There was so much, uh, all of you, the local people got so upset by that that a bunch of investors came in, and they actually were able to save this place. So it's a good thing it's still here. Five thousand the subsequent session ends of the tour maintain that dependence on pitfall discussions about soldiers' safety from threats and decontest and widespread perception from command distinct different emphasis at each side of said position. Left present, each successive glance. Sovereignty determination time to add post battles. Arrive from LD function. And work terminate column. Send a guest or attend the event consequential consider a date confirmation of sanity appointment. And no further to accomplish works from base or hand to it. Bit line. Museum purchase with funds generously provided by Robert Kohler, 2019. In the pantheon of Yoruba deities, the smelling ghost is a destructive, frightening force who emits a terrible odor that obstructs health and life. Twins depicts the ghost with a twisted mouth, hollow eyes, and imbalanced projections sprouting from its the memory of elaborate and scary masks he saw in ritual contexts as a child. But according to Yoruba tradition, evil is just as necessary as good, opposing forces almost always coexist, balancing each other in perpetual negotiation. Ghost hunting Sniffers go in search of spirits at an off beetle factory event. By Alicia Gray Painter published September 28, 2015 updated on September 29, 2015 at 1.13pm. The sense of sight is typically invoked when it comes to searching for ethereal beings from beyond the veil, as in so, did you see any ghosts? Less referenced is our sense of smell. No one asks did you smell any ghosts? But consider that those buildings believed to be haunted are often described as bearing a trace of old perfume or the scent of candle wax or wine, or some other odoriferous substance favored by the being now long gone. Your sniffer, and not your eyes or your ears, will be called into action at an unusual self-guided ghost hunting tour on Saturday, Oct. 3. Well, not totally self-guided. Aficionados of apparitions will first gather at the Institute for Art and Olfaction to discuss how our ability to sense odor may lead us to supernatural findings of the phantomious sort. It's free to join the fun at the Institute, but if you want a special Phantosmia map for your self-guided explorations at several Los Angeles ghost spots, you'll need to show with all fiver. After the gathering, ghost hunters are welcome to set off on their own in search of 13 smelly ghosts around Southern California. No surprise that 13 is the number of the night, and no surprise that you may be searching on some celebrities from the great beyond.
There is also a Phantosmia kit for sale, created by a fragrance mad group of fans from the Smelly Vials Perfume Club, a punk rock perfume making society. The kit is priced at 60 bucks and will pay homage to the spirited sense you're looking for. Yeah, the kit also comes with a map you'll need on your nose forward adventure. The scene. Want to find new things to do in Los Angeles? The scene's lifestyle stories have you covered. Here's your go-to source on where the fun is across SoCo and for the weekend. Sweet, corny, salty, yum, Thursday food deals begin at the OC Fair. Citizen Science. Bat buffs, help count local roosts with Natural History Museum guides at the lead. We live in a region that's flush with phantom stories, both involving the old Tinseltown and some newer nightmare icons as well. But to search for them in a fresh way, involving the appendage in the middle of your face, is a twist that time has come. Was that a trace of lilac perfume you just smelled in that back room of that one bar? Or was it rose perfume? Sometimes the nose knows that something strange is among us, before the other senses have come to their senses. Copyright Freel, NBC Local Media. Submit something called phantom smells. Now you'll be out there sometimes and all of a sudden you'll like smell something you shouldn't be smelling at the moment. People will be out there and all of a sudden start smelling campfires. There's no campfires anywhere. They'll smell the smell of horses when there's no horses anywhere around. People will smell the smell of lavender. They'll smell the smell of cigars and things like that. And pipes. Well, actually this really happens because I was actually down by the cemetery one winter. Snow on the ground, absolutely no wind. And as I said the word lavender, the smell of lavender washed over the entire group. Really strong. So strong we actually stopped the tour to actually try to figure out where the smell was coming from. And about 30 seconds later, it just went away. So keep your noses open, guys. We may actually smell something. After a five-year, multi-million dollar cleaning and restoration, Second Rock opened up in this new building in 2008. Just to put it into a quick perspective for you, you're looking at the rough equivalent of an 1800 IMAX theater. This is what people bought tickets to go see instead of movies. There's only about 16 of these left in the world. They are very rare and they are priceless. If you have any questions about the Psychorama or how this was all done or the battle itself, please do feel free to ask. And most of all, we want to thank you for visiting us today here in historic Gettysburg. The chance for victory in Pennsylvania is gone, and they have lost thousands of soldiers and many valuable leaders. Some 6,000 are dead, wounded, or captured. What propelled the Confederates forward against such odds? What compelled the Union men to sustain the fight? The same questions could be asked of soldiers, Union and Confederate, on many battlefields of this war. You ask me if the thought of death does not alarm me. I will say that I do not wish to die. I myself am as big a coward as any could be. Give me the bullet before the coward and all my friends and companions are going forward. The man who does not dread to die or to be mutilated is a lunatic. The man who, dreading these things, still faces them for the sake of duty and honor is a hero. Across the generations, this scene has continued to abide in memory as a moment when the acts of men shaped the fate of a nation. In great deeds, something abides. On great fields, something stays. Forms change and pass. Bodies disappear, but spirits linger to consecrate the ground for the vision place of souls. Generations that know us not are heart drawn to see where and by whom great things were suffered and done for them. Strong defensive battle against waves of Confederate attacks. But today, 
General Lee believes his army can deliver a crushing blow. He will risk a frontal assault against the Union Center on Cemetery Ridge. An attack on the Union Center is Lee's last hope for victory. At 1 o'clock, 150 Confederate cannon open fire. Union guns thunder back. Scores of men fall on both sides. Union soldiers overwhelmed. 